The scripture reading this morning is from Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. <clears throat> now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. Had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear. From now on you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Well, thank you, Ken. It's good to see everybody this morning, and being able to talk about God and being able to worship God is just that much more of a blessing. So I hope you guys have had a good week. This year has started off well, and that everything is good, and that uh, everything is working out the way it's supposed to. When we look at this idea of conforming to the heart of Christ, we had talked about that last week as kind of being our theme and uh, being able to look at some of the things that go on there. And so I want to look at this idea of what we think we're supposed to be doing, and then when it actually kind of kicks in, um, the passage that we've looked at this morning that Ken has read to us in Luke 5 is one of those places. Ashby talked about it just briefly with a guy named Tim Keller, that all of a sudden the realization comes, this is so much bigger than what I ever understood before. And I think all of us have come to that point. We, we think we get it. We think we understand it. And the logic and the simplicity is there. And then all of a sudden, it just opens up a whole new world. And how does that happen? Well, I want to look at this first part of this. And we're going to actually go through all of this in Luke 5. But I want to put it in context of what happens with us. So, if you just look at this first part, he talks about the occasion where Jesus goes, and he goes to the Lake Gennesaret. He's teaching. The crowd's all around him. They're pushing in, and so he's got an ingenious way of doing this, but he's got ulterior motives, too. Now, how do you train people? How do you make new leaders if you don't have any time at all? I mean, everywhere you go, people follow you. Everywhere you go, there are people wanting to be healed. There are people wanting you to teach. There are people who are, are interested in whatever you have to say, whatever you would touch, because they've heard all these amazing stories about you. And then how would you ever have time to really train people? Well, this is how Jesus does this. And so I think it's important to look at how does he get across this idea of what the mission really is and build disciples the way he builds disciples? How is he going to do that? Is it just the best one in the crowd that we just take, you know, everybody who came today and, okay, all of you who listen the best are now going to be apostles? And is that the way it is? Or it seems as if Jesus does some specific training. He had already called the brothers, Peter and Andrew and James and John, before 
We know we see them in Galilee. We see them by the Jordan. And this seems to be the final time when he's going to confront them. And it seems as if they don't even understand the call. They've been looking for the Messiah, and Jesus is there. And John has said, this is him. And they're like, okay, but then what? And I think a lot of times we get to the then what? And so they're thinking about being a disciple. Well, you know, how much does it cost? What does it mean? Is it going to interrupt my work? Is it going to interrupt my home life? Uh, What all things do I have to do for this? And so we think about it. And we go off and on. Some days are better than other days. If you look at what Jesus does here, the first thing he does is to involve them. And so Jesus sees the need, he's teaching, he's being backed up to the lake, he sees the boat, he gets into, happens to be Simon Peter's boat, and pushes out just, you know, about this deep, right? So that nobody's going to come out and get in the boat, and yet sound carries across the water, and everyone's able to hear. And so he does that so that they're able to get the lesson. And he's got a captive audience in the boat because Peter was there with him. He's in the boat. He teaches the lesson. Well, now you're going to get the lesson across because the guy's sitting right there in the boat with you. And so he's got to get it, doesn't he? And yet, when you look at what really happens, it really isn't about the words. Somehow the words that he's saying and the fact that he teaches is just not enough. They get the lesson. I'm just not sure they get the point. And a lot of times we know what all the answers are, but we really didn't understand the questions. And so it's more important to go on and to realize this. So I'm going to interrupt us in this story for just a minute. We'll come back to it. But what is our mission? What is it that we're doing? What is it that we're all about? Well, there's a lot of different things and a lot of different ways to put it. Perhaps this is a good one. It's to lead people to know Christ and to be conformed to his image. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Sounds like a good one. Um, If you look at Scripture... There's a few other ones that we can see from Scripture. What's our mission? Our mission is to do the will of God, to be pleasing to God, to convert the world for Christ. That would be part of our mission as well, to save ourselves and then to save other people. Yeah, everybody's good so far? Yeah, if you nod too far down, I'm going to know that. (laughs) Okay, if your head doesn't come back up, that's a bad sign. But we agree about our mission. We usually don't have disagreement about that. We know what we're supposed to do. We know what Christianity is about. We don't have any disagreement on this. We just somehow don't see it happening. Our mission is logical. It's important. It's what we're able to do. And so we tend to look toward what is it we can do to measure this and to make it something that we can count on. And so we look at the goals and the objectives and things that are explained and things that are measured. And so one of the things is you look at whether or not we're reaching our goal or our mission is we want to look at church attendance. Well, that's until COVID. And then how do you know? It kind of messes with that, doesn't it? Are people really attending? We look at baptisms. We look at how many people are baptized. But then you've also got to look at, do those people really stay? Are they faithful? How long does it last? We look at whatever numbers can find. And so we seem to do that when we talk about our goal or our mission is we want to look at at how the numbers are. If you go in a race... How do you know when you win? How far do you race? Well, yeah, that's, you know, tell me how long the race is. I want to know that before we begin. 
Is it the 26-mile marathon? Is it the 500-yard dash or the 50-yard dash? That seems to be more, the 50-yard walk seems to be more my speed these days. Uh, exactly how long is the race? I can tell you when I'm walking how long I'm going to walk. I walk until I get back home. And that way I know it's over. And, but we are going to put a lot of different numbers to this. So we're going to look at the time and how long did it take you to run. We're going to look at the distance and how long did it take you to run this certain distance. It's a mile long and we're going to measure it all out and the course is going to be there and it's got to be exactly this course. And how far uphill was it or how far downhill was it? And how much weight were you carrying? It looks like nobody's carrying any extra weight. They don't even bring their purse with them. I mean, look at this. How can... And when you start thinking about it, that's a lot of times how we measure the race. But how do you tell who wins? See, the one who wins is going to be the one with the most endurance or the most determination or the most purpose. And so when we start looking at those things, how do you measure those? We're really not able to measure those, are we? And so I can tell you how to be saved. What are the points? Why we would do each one? Exactly what they're supposed to do. What life looks like as a Christian. What the habits are. How to treat your family. How to do Bible study. How to get more out of your Bible. And yet it isn't about the scriptures you memorize or the money you give or all of that. There seems to be something more. And so let's look at this idea of connecting what we're going to call heart with our mission. Because our mission seems to get bogged down in the details. You're supposed to do this and this and this. But heart is something else. It's something that's much bigger. And so there's several passages I want to look at this morning. First one is in Luke 19. Uh, I hope you know the story. I'm just going to look at the very end, which talks about the purpose and the mission that Jesus gives. It's the story of Zacchaeus. He has climbed up in a tree in order to see Jesus, and sure enough, as Jesus passes by, Jesus says to Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house today. Okay, that's great. He has given prestige and privilege to Zacchaeus, and Some people start grumbling about Zacchaeus and about Jesus not being righteous because he's going and, you know, now Zacchaeus is a sinner because he's a tax collector and we know he's a terrible. They don't think of it going the other way. They always think evil is going to influence Jesus and so therefore he can't be righteous. They never think Jesus is going to influence evil And Zacchaeus, who has been this person who's not a good person, who has been cheating and been doing all these things, and that somehow Jesus is going to affect him. And so what happens immediately is the repentance. And so it says, And Zacchaeus stood and he said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Boy, that's a purpose statement, isn't it? That's exactly what he came to do. And so we can see Zacchaeus as one of those people who is perhaps lost and what happened that Jesus did. Jesus has said, I'm I'm going to accept you. And what Zacchaeus says, and I'm going to repent. I'm going to say, I've done all of this, and I am going to repay it back. I'm going to show my repentance and the fact that I'm willing to make it right on any of the things that I might have done. And so the Son of Man is to seek and save the lost. And what does lost mean? 
Well, in this case, it means being a disciple. In this case, it means repentance and being able to get rid of those past sins. It means a change from where he has been maybe not such a good person in the past and cheating the people with taxes, and now he deals with the sin and what he would become. He's a changed man. He doesn't go back to the same way again. And Jesus has effected a change in him. And so we can see he came to seek and save the lost, and Zacchaeus is one of those. And there's something that happens with that. Well, perhaps the one that we use the most is found in the end of Matthew. It's after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. It's the time where Jesus comes back to his disciples says, And Jesus came, and he said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Well, it's what we call the Great Commission. It's where he sends out disciples and says, This is what I want you to do. This is what you're supposed to do. All authority has now been given to me since he is resurrected from the dead. And he says, I want you to go and make disciples. And there are some specific ways in which you make disciples. The first of those is by baptism. That you are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Recognize it comes from them. It's about their authority. It is for the remission of sins. It is to the fulfilling of righteousness. It's what makes us righteous by the forgiveness of God. And then he says, we're going to teach you to observe all that Jesus commanded. And sometimes we emphasize the baptism a lot more than we emphasize the second part of this. But understand that both parts of this are important. And so we need to make sure that they go together because sometimes we can work so much on the baptism that we've done it in such a way that we don't get to teach them afterward and somehow they are gone and we didn't make it their baptism where they're now able to come and learn about all the things of Jesus. And so make sure we understand both of those are what he's talking about. And so... We need to make both of these work, where the baptism is for the cleansing of sin and where the learning is for them to be able to be Christ-like people. And this is what he gives us. This is our mission. This is our goal. We understand this, right? I'm just checking to see if heads are still okay. Most of you guys are doing pretty good here. I just thought I'd check and make sure. So how well do we do on the teaching them to observe? I think we do pretty well. We do a great job of teaching. How well do they do on the observing? Well, sometimes that's not so much. But you look at all the things that go on and all the ways in which it's taught, and yeah, it's taught a lot. And yet, a lot of times, we'll get people who say, well, I never heard that. Really? I mean, it was said a lot. One of the reasons Joshua wanted to have his class is because he says, I'm just going to go back to basics and just teach some basic things about Christianity because people don't know this. Well, it isn't that it hasn't been said. And it isn't that it hasn't been taught a lot. It has been, but there seems to be a difference in what people are able to bring in or people are able to absorb. And so that's great. And if you missed that part, Joshua will be having a class on basics in Christianity. Go go learn from that. And we'll teach it and we'll teach it and we'll We do a lot with that, but somehow people are not touched in heart. They hear the lesson, 
But in the context of our other story, no one lets the boat sink because their sins are more important than fish. The third one's in Colossians chapter 1. And this is Paul's. He has been through the first part of this. He has been through the repentance. Ananias came and talked to him after his encounter with Jesus and told him about the baptism. And so he has been baptized. And then he has learned a tremendous amount. He was already a Old Testament scholar. And so he begins applying all of this. And as he goes and as he teaches, he says, here's my purpose. He says, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but it's now revealed to the saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all energy that he powerfully works within me. And so as you look at the passage and what he's saying, he's obviously emphasizing this second part of this. Yes, it's important for them to have this first part of making this covenant of baptism into Christ. But Paul's emphasis is on the fact that I want to make him mature in Christ. Somehow we've got to connect the idea of heart along with okay, what am I supposed to do now? And it's not just checking boxes. The purpose is to have Christ in us. The purpose is to have this hope of glory. The purpose is to have this mission so that everyone is mature in Christ. And how does Paul do that? You see, when he talks about his Christianity, because some people question Is he really a Christian? Is he really even a good apostle? Is he even doing anything that's important? What does he say? Does he say, well, I was baptized in Damascus. I've got a certificate. Does he say, you know what? I've been at church every single Sunday for the last 12 years, 30 years, 40 years. I've been at church, and he cites his church attendance. Does he say, I know the names of all the apostles? Does he say, I can name all the books in the Bible? Well, not yet, because he's still writing them. I mean, that's kind of where he is, and all the apostles. Well, no, I'm just not sure that's even a list that they would memorize. Maybe he would know all of the kings of Israel or something like that. But it isn't found in all the details. When Paul has to defend himself, and when Paul has to say this struggle and this toil and this energy that powerfully works within him, what does he say? In 2 Corinthians 11, he says, I've had far more imprisonments, countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I was adrift at sea and on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, in dangers from robbers, in dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentile, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers from false brethren in toil and hardship through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst, often without food and in cold and exposure." What's he trying to say? I didn't know all that was required, did you? He's trying to show this is what a disciple looks like. This is what heart looks like. And it's not the fact that, well, we made it to church, although that may be a big thing, right, Mark? I mean, some days it's just hard enough to get here. And... I appreciate your thoughts and what all you're saying. And some days we realize there's more to the story. And there's so much more in all of this. And so we look at this and we know this. And it's about the dedication that we have. 
And so when we look at our mission and the passage we would use for our mission and the people who said that for this mission, how did they get there? We wish we were dedicated like that, don't we? Well, maybe not quite so many beatings, but <laughs> we wish we were dedicated like Paul was, where we have a, a list that just obviously describes this incredible devotion to God. Well, let's go back to the story of the brothers and where they were and look at exactly how Jesus does this with them. So Jesus involves them. They're by the sea, and there's Peter's boat, and let's all get into the boat. And uh, then he says, let's put out into the deep. and Let down your nets for a catch. Well, they'd caught fish before. They know how to fish. They're fishermen, and Jesus gives them their catch. And once you notice the progression of how it happens, and so the boat begins to sink, and he calls for James and John to bring their boat, and the boat begins to sink again. And so they've got two boats now. They're full of fish. There's still fish in the net, and it looks like both boats are going down. And what's the most important thing? Well, they're all distracted with all the fish, right? I mean, that's what you have to do. You have to deal with the fish, and we can't let the fish go because the fish become most important. Get those fish to land. Try to keep those fish because, after all, God's given us fish. These are my fish, and they, I'm not going to let my fish go because my fish are most important. And so get those fish, keep those fish, get those fish in a place where we can keep them where they're not going to get back into the water. And fish has been their whole life. Fish is what's most important. And fish is all there is. And they told stories about the one that they got away. They don't want to tell stories about the boatload of fish that got away. Keep the fish. That's the most important thing that there is. And what is Jesus doing? He's sitting in a sinking boat full of fish teaching and what's really most important in life and Jesus is watching them fight for fish and Peter becomes very aware of himself and his obsession with fish and very aware of Jesus and therefore very aware of how sinful he is and how his motives don't measure up because right now fish is the most important thing. It's critical. It's time sensitive. We have to. And the biggest thing in his life is fish. All the counting, all the weighing, all the measuring, all the details. Here's a big one. Here's the most. Here's the weight. Here's the number. Isn't that what we do when we've been fishing? How many did you get? Tell them how long it was, how big it was, how it struggled, how it fought. How... And what is Jesus doing when we catch ourselves fighting for the details? For what we really thought was important, for our mission, for what's been our goal See, I think they had heard the sermon before. When Jesus called them this last time, something changed. It hit their heart. And they have this huge blessing from God. And they're just overwhelmed. Because this huge blessing for God is nothing compared to the guy sitting in the boat. The mission can be about the work, but it, it has to also be about something that we feel. And we realize it isn't big enough. I think sometimes we look at life like this. It's like a railroad track. If you look far enough down that track, those lines are going to join. 
but it's out there somewhere. And somewhere, the mission of what I'm supposed to be doing and how I'm supposed to be feeling are running side by side. I know I ought to feel more like coming to church. I don't know I ought to feel like being more involved. And I know that this is going to work because somewhere off in the distance, this is going to connect. And it's going to come about that all of those details of what somebody told me I was supposed to believe and supposed to be doing and all of those, if we could just get the right program, if, you know, we could, eventually it'll all connect somewhere down the line because we can see it out there. It all comes together at one point and it's just a little further and it's just a little further and it's just a little further And yet the truth is those railroad tracks are never going to get any closer at all. If we could just get to people's heart. And that usually means we're going to be involved somehow. You don't see it happen without people being involved in what Jesus is doing. Either he interrupts their life or he is there, or they have chosen to follow, it means that they will be involved somehow. These guys had already been called by Jesus. They are doing the things that they should. Yet sometimes we're just tired, and our heart really isn't in the mission. And when they ask for volunteers, we really don't want to. We don't feel anything. We don't feel it anymore. We have lots of teaching Oh, so much teaching, but nothing really hits our heart. We've had lots of relationships. That's the answer, right? All these relationships, and we've had lots of relationships, and we've left most of those relationships. I mean, we're still good friends. It's just you've got to move sometimes or be somewhere else or your life changes, and they help. They're not the answer. It really comes down to the heart condition. And it's about having faith in God. It's about what makes David volunteer to fight Goliath. How do you get there? It's about what makes Daniel pray when he knows about the lions. It's about what makes Noah build an ark or Abraham a crib. When you see it, you know it, and you have to do it. And Jesus calls you to do the unthinkable. And it isn't about the details anymore because you realize who's sitting in the boat with you. And so you quit counting times of attendance and saying, yes, I'm faithful but you count more about what I got when I was there. And the teaching has been there, but did we learn something and not did we go through the class? And can we believe beyond our reason and beyond our logic, beyond the logic that we teach about salvation, about steps and about details to try to get to what's really the heart of what Christianity is? Not what the elders believe or what the preacher believes, but what God called me to believe. It's us. It's me. We believe and we're determined to make that belief come true. It's not a crowd crucifying in anger about what somebody else is trying to say about crucify. We are very aware and we worship and we believe And it's not because we believe in ourselves. Oh, not at all. That's the current one that everybody has. Oh, just believe in yourself. And right, but we've seen ourselves and we've seen our own smallness and we've seen our own mistakes and we've seen how much bigger Jesus is than all those little things that annoy us or our own failings. And I finally realize I'm a sinful man. And the only choice is to follow Jesus. And I don't deserve him, and he could leave me behind, but he won't. 
And he stands there waiting for me to follow. And he gives me a mission. And I have to follow. And I hope that's where you are today. That he gives you a mission and you feel that it's yours. It's not what everybody's telling you you have to do. It comes from you. And so today, right now, now is the time to be baptized if you haven't been. Or maybe we need three days of blindness to get us there. To where we'd really believe it then. Before we'd say, okay, I give up. It's time to be baptized now. It's about repentance. And we don't have to climb a tree and have everybody talk about us and say all kinds of bad things about us to realize that our life's a mess and we haven't done everything right. And it's time to talk to Jesus about our sins in a way that we've never talked to him before. And it's about letting him sit in your boat. It's about being involved with whatever's going to happen next. And realize if you let him sit in your boat, there's going to be something that comes up. He's going to suggest a net and the other side of the boat. And he's going to suggest, and we're going to be ready. We're going to be ready for amazing things. Because he's touched our heart. What do you need to do today to answer that call of Jesus? Let's stand and sing.